Structural engineering, you basically have to think from first principles, I guess. And, you know, that, that you could say the same thing about Bitcoin. For you to understand it, you, you have to think from first principles. Hello, I am Cody Allingham, and this is the Transformation of Value, a place for thinkers and builders where together we explore freedom, energy and creativity through the lens of Bitcoin. In this episode, I am joined by Anes Katan. We talk about how his company, Structural Engineers NZ, have embraced Bitcoin by accepting it for payment as well as holding Bitcoin on the balance sheet of the company. We talk about business, Anes's background and his Bitcoin story, and the broader outlook for the construction market and housing sector as it relates to inflation and monetary policy. Now this show is supported by you. My vision is to make the transformation of value into something that we can take with us into the future. If you want to help me grow this show, please consider making a donation either through my website or by tipping directly to the show's Bitcoin wallet. Or just pass this episode on to a friend who you think may enjoy it. Finally, you can always email me at hello at the transformation of value.com and I will get back to you. Thanks for joining me today. Um, I thought we could start off with a bit about your engineering background and your company, Structural Engineers New Zealand, please. Oh, thanks for having me, Cody. Well, I, I started studying when I was uh, in 2007 and finished in 2010. It just happened to be both my brothers are also engineers, uh, but we all kind of took different paths. My eldest brother, Sidia, he went in straight into structural design his whole career uh my our middle brother faris went into project management sort of construction management and eventually sales and i did a bit of both so i did structural design to start with and then went and worked in civil construction after a few years uh so sadir worked at uh, worldly parsons with a colleague ted and uh, after a few years of working together ted decided to leave and start his own thing and he actually started the company, Structural Engineers New Zealand. Once he had a decent amount of work, um, asked Sadia if he'd like to join, and 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 Sadia did so um, in around 2014. So it was uh, the two of them to start with. Ted eventually decided to move to Thailand to to live there. So <laughs> good life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, to, to live on the cheap. Yeah. <laughs> and and basically, Sadia was the face of the company after that. In 2015, I think it was, um, I joined them part-time and uh, Sadir and I worked from his garage. I remember the days. <laughs> it was just the two of us from the garage while Ted was in Thailand. And uh, we, yeah, we, we started getting more and more work. We approached, we started looking for work, word of mouth as well. Um, our, our, our name got around and we eventually had basically full, full-time work for the three of us. And I remember one day we were, we were sat in the garage and uh, I said to Sadia, what, what, where do you see this going? Like, what, what, what do you, where do you see us in five years sitting in the garage or doing something more? And uh, we both agreed that it was probably time we moved out of the garage and maybe grow the company a little bit. So that in 2019, an opportunity came up uh, with one of Sadia's friends, um, she had worked for an architect company out in um, East Tamaki. They had a small space in their office that they wanted to uh, lease out, essentially, to, to a structural engineering company, ideally, so you know we can um, work together. So we moved in, just the two of us, and uh, we, we hired our first employee in 2019 at the new office. Our other brother, Faris, was working in Abu Dhabi at the time, and he decided to move back to New Zealand with his wife to start a family. So we thought that was a good opportunity for him to join us. Being in the construction industry, sales as well, he's got some good skills to be a business manager. So we got him on. And yeah, that was that, that's how the company sort of came together. And since the COVID days, basically, we've just been expanding ever since, um, adding more employees at different levels. And now we're eight people in, in our Auckland office with Ted working in Thailand. Yeah, it sounds like it's a bit of a, a dynasty with all of, all of the brothers <laughs> working on uh, on the company. It's, uh, it's pretty cool, man. Yeah, it's funny, actually, when because I'm not originally from New Zealand. Uh, we're from Iraq. Um, oh, really? Uh, yeah, yeah. 
Uh, we moved here when I was 12 in 2002. Uh, my dad and his brothers all had, a, had their own businesses in, on the same street. And growing up, that was really cool just to, you know, in the summer holidays going there and uh, spending time with the cousins and stuff. And it just kind of feels like we're, we're building something similar together. Yeah. Where was that? Yeah. In, in Baghdad. We moved here um, 20, 22 years ago. Yeah. Um, we, ha we haven't ba been back since, except for my dad went for, for a holiday once. No, oh, so when, my... when you were younger, when you were still living there, you're talking about with the, your family with their shops on the same street. Oh, yes. Yeah. 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 yeah so that, that would have been, I don't know, mid to late 90s, I'd say. Yeah. Yeah. Do you feel like what's your connection? If I may ask, what is your connection like with Iraq in terms of cultural family over there, still relatives and just kind of that up, your upbringing over there? Um, we do have some family there, but a lot of them have managed to, to get out. Of, of Iraq before the war started, uh, kind of displaced everywhere, to be honest. Some made it to Europe, some in America, a couple of families here in New Zealand. Mm. Um, I, I, we probably have, I'd say, two families from each, uh, each of my parents um, in Iraq. I, I personally don't have any, uh, I, don't, I don't feel like I, I want to ruin my memories going back now, um, if you know what I mean, because I, as a child, and not have been anywhere else at the time, I remember a certain way. And now to go back um, and see it, I think it might, it might ruin a, a few memories that I have. Yeah. Uh, it, it, eventually, I'd like to go back and, 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 and see the place. Yeah. I, I yeah. appreciate it. It's maybe quite personal, but you said you moved 22 years ago. So was that just on uh, the war in Iraq? Yeah, it was, it was a year before. Yeah. Did yeah. you, was that sort of like your, your your father thought you know you guys needed to get out or was it yeah so uh my parents had been trying to get out for i'd say 10 years before that yeah. um but it was very difficult to you know not not many countries were accepting people from iraq at the time and uh we tried multiple times for new zealand uh through the immigration system uh 97 and i think it was 98 as well mm -hmm. At the time, New Zealand was accepting, but my, my dad <laughs> failed the English test a couple of times. So. Oh, no. The old <laughs> man. <laughs> the old man. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, my, uh, my, uh, my auntie's family were able to come, yeah. and um, eventually my, my mom came for a visit, applied for a visa, and then pulled us up uh, through that. Yeah. yeah. Well, what strikes me, and again, as, as I said, I appreciate it's quite a personal thing because, I mean, there was a lot of devastation brought to that region and, uh, you know, you have fond memories of it, you know, and um, I think this idea that you guys have now been able to bring this, uh, your family, you know, your, you and your brothers have been able to build this this company, which is doing amazing stuff and, you know, you're hiring people and, and I mean, it's a, it's a success story. I mean, I think that's pretty awesome, man. I mean, that you guys can do that and... Um, be working on something as important as structural engineering, which I guess if, if we could maybe talk a bit about what that means, maybe people aren't aware of what, what what's involved, I mean, how the industry works and the different players. Maybe you could just tell us a bit about that, please. Yeah, sure. Uh, so structural engineering, is it's a branch of civil engineering, and it focuses on analyzing and designing the structural components of a building or a structure um, to, to support the loads that are induced on it. Um, and you know the the, the loads come in in a, in a few different uh, variety of ways, and um, you have your vertical loads, so you, your gravity loads, the the self weight of the the building itself, as well as the live loads, people um, using the building, and you've also got um, uh, lateral loads, um, horizontal loads, induced by wind uh, or, or seismic uh, loads, earthquakes, so. Um, uh, we essentially have to resolve this, those forces through the structure and and uh, resolve them at the ground at the foundation level. Um, yeah, so it's yeah. it's basically the spine of the building. Mm. If you will. And, yeah. and you work quite closely with the architects. Like, how, I mean, what's that structure look like in terms of the mm. kind of the hierarchy and the relationships with the other players? Yeah. So um, let's take a house for example. Um, uh, typically, uh, the client would work together with the architect and come up with a design of how they want it to look. And um, the architect may uh, specify um, some load bearing systems that we would eventually, it would come to us and we would design those. And um, um, 
you know, we'd specify the beam sizes, the bracing elements, um, the, the roof structure, floor structure, and the foundation. Mm. And we work closely with the architect to uh, collaborate with them throughout the project to um, to deliver it. Yeah. I am keen, Anes, to just maybe touch a little bit about your Bitcoin story. And I, and I hope we can loop this back into the building and engineering stuff. But um, tell me about how you got into Bitcoin, please. The, <laughs> like many do, I, I heard about it um, a few times and just really didn't pay attention. Um, let's say that was probably around the 2017, 2018 you know, it made ma- mainstream news during that cycle, and I, I did hear about it. And you know, it crashed after that, so yeah, I, I did, didn't really think about it at the time. Um, in 2020, uh, during the COVID crash, my friend actually mentioned to me, "You should, you should get in now. It's a good time." And I, I, I remember saying to him, um, "I think I'll wait for 1K." <laughs> oh no! <laughs> and that, and that, <laughs> that was a costly decision. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, not long after that, my partner and I were looking to buy a house, um, let's say towards late 2020. And we were just seeing the house market just go ballistic. You know, prices were going up 30, 40% over CVs and whatnot. Uh, I was just thinking, what what's going on? Like, what, what's actually happening? Um, so, at the same time, my friend who had you know, uh, told me to buy some earlier hit me up again and said, you know, it's never too late. So I, I bought a little bit, started learning about it, and, and it all came together for me, you know, after a couple of years of, of learning about how Bitcoin works and then also how the existing financial system works. And it just made sense, you know, um, why house prices were going up when we were trying to buy um uh, and, and it finally clicked, you know. It took it took a while. I, I was, <laughs> you probably didn't want to know me at the time because I couldn't stop talking about it. But, uh, <laughs> uh, I'm sure we all go through that, but I've kind of <laughs> kind of relaxed a little bit now. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> Not really, actually. But <laughs> oh, that that's so, awesome, man. So you you, you went through it. Uh, you, you you studied it. I mean, was there anything influential that really helped you understand and make make make, uh, make it all click? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I, I've, I've, I clocked all the podcasts, you know. <laughs> but uh, I'd say the Bitcoin Standard was a was a big eye opener, uh, and then and then Jeff Booth's book uh, was, you know, the price that of was tomorrow. amazing. Yeah. yeah, the price of tomorrow was. Yeah, I read it a couple of times, and uh, watched his podcast with Robert Breedlove. Mm. Um, that whole series, and it, it's just opened my eyes a lot about yeah. what's going on. And the the funny thing is. You know, since that time, I started following people on Twitter and and whatnot on YouTube, and you you just, for me, I've just been listening to people, and you know, everyone has their opinions and whatnot. But you just look back and think, you know, who's been right over the last couple of years? Who's who's who got it right? And to me, Jeff Booth has been one of those people. He's been spot on, and yeah, so just been following the following people who who have gotten things right um and it seems to be a lot of bitcoiners to be honest so <laughs> yeah follow the signal <laughs> yeah exactly you know lynn alden obviously uh preston Posh, um uh peter mccormick's show is, is great as well so yeah yeah well it's it's a lively discussion and and i do hope we can sort of loop this back in because um i know you mentioned with your company as well you're you're exploring bitcoin uh mm. so maybe could you elaborate a bit more on that please yeah, so actually, um, at the start of this year, we 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 started accepting it. We haven't advertised it as such, but we we've just have a have it in our invoices that you can pay for, with Bitcoin if you like to. Um, and we've been I've been meaning to do this earlier, but um, we've started uh, holding Bitcoin as a treasury asset um, as part of our our um, savings that we keep, you know, in case of a rainy day. Mm-hmm. Um, a small percentage, but it's a you know decent amount, and uh, we'll probably be increasing that uh, over time. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's been it's it's been good so far. You know, it's been only been a couple of months since we started that um, for the for the business, and uh, you know the <laughs> the guys are excited and yeah, it's yeah. going well. Can you tell me a bit more about that in terms of how you were able to structure that with your company? I mean, did you get help from your accountant or like what is there any more detail you can give around how you set up the treasury 
Yeah, so I mean, uh, I spoke with accountants just around the uh, tax laws in New Zealand, things like that. But um, yeah, and, uh, we basically just hold it as an asset on the balance sheet. Essentially, we, you know, the three of us control it. Um, yeah, it's pretty, pretty easy, yeah. right? <laughs> but, but, yeah, pretty standard, really. Um, yeah. And and I just wanted to mention, it's it's not. Uh, paper bitcoin that's <laughs> it's real bitcoin it's real bitcoin oh that's awesome i want to link this back to the engineering thing because uh it seems like the work you do this i mean this is really important stuff you know the the building uh, needs to be safe and obviously new zealand is an earthquake prone country so there's a lot of um, need for buildings to withstand um, you know seismic pressures environmental pressures and how this relates to Bitcoin, because, you know, Bitcoin is, uh, I mean, it's sound money. And I mean, have you just on a conceptual layer, have you been able to sort of connect in and con- connect those two ideas? Hmm. Well, structural engineering, you basically have to think from first principles, I guess. And, you know, that, that you could say the same thing about Bitcoin for you to understand it. You, you have to think from first principles. We, we do have a lot of... Um, regulations and standards to follow in, in engineering that determine what 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 you um the way you design things to to withstand seismic and, and wind pressures yeah sorry i can't really think of any other way to tie that in no, um, no it's, it's okay yeah. well i i guess because what i'm getting at though is that there is a reality right like the building needs to stand up and you can't fake that uh, and and when you do try and fake it there's real consequences to life and so just for me, I mean, I guess I'm from the outside, I see it and I think, mm. oh, well, clearly those things work. And there's a reason yeah. why engineers uh, and all people who understand things, you know, I mean, Michael Saylor is the classic example. He had a background with uh, aerospace engineering and, and many people have a connection somehow to that, that there's sort of a, I don't know, a reality that mm. Bitcoin speaks to that you can't really fake. Uh, if yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh... That could be just, the, you know, for me, it was maybe just being curious and engineers are curious people. They want to understand how things work from first principles. So I think that's what got me so um, into it. Mm. Just really wanted to understand why does this thing have value? How does the system work? Um, you know, how does the network work? How does it keep its decentralization? Those are the things that uh, I really wanted to figure out. And I, I guess being a structural engineer also, you know, you've got to find your loads, you've got to work them through the building and take them down to ground. And it's just, you know, you're, you're trying to complete the puzzle essentially. So, yeah. yeah. Well, well, I think there's also something quite, um, how would you say, you know, a building, it, it's it's not necessarily scientific in the sense that many things can be technically scientific, whereas engineering, it's like, it's more logical this than mm. that, if you know what I mean. It's sort of like yeah, an engineering, in an engineering principle, something like using triangles and like you know just basic trigonometry that then scales mm. up. It's 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 a bit more real, and you can use a lot more rules of thumb and things like this as opposed to things that are maybe intellectual. Not to say that it's not intellectual, but it's kind of like again, you can't fake it. You yeah, know, yeah. It, it either stands up on its own or it doesn't, sort of thing, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I agree. Yeah. So that on that note, though, I'm um, bringing this back to the broader space. Though, obviously, New Zealand is in an interesting place where there's this kind of housing market boom, which you talked about. Um, you know, you were looking at it and thinking, of "What's going on? Why? You know, why? Why are these things keep going up in value?" And we've seen uh, some real challenges because you know houses are you know quite regulated at the zoning laws and all sorts of things which mean they are kind of this this ponzi right like um people you know they can't build them um fast enough to keep up with demand and the one the new ones that are being built are maybe not of the same quality so i mean mm-hmm. just broadly with this bitcoin first principles lens i mean yeah. what is your take on on the housing market so my first take is that the demand is almost fake there is no you know, the demand for houses, sure, there's obviously people need to live somewhere, but the, the amount of houses that we're building um, that are being sold to investors are, is just crazy. Mm. And to me, the demand driven through, you know, lowering interest rates or QE or whatever you want to call it, um, it, it that is just fake demand to me. Um, so, you know, let's say central banks lower rates, people... Uh, go out to buy houses because they don't want to lose their savings, which essentially causes demand for houses. 
people go out and build more houses, w- w- which are, you know, those houses are are often pushed through to to try and get them as cheap as possible. And it, to me, the demand is is a bit fake, to be honest. Okay, that, that's how I see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well it, it's 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 hard to explain. Uh, but, uh, yeah. No, no, I, I, I think I understand. And I mean, pulling yeah. on that, I've seen some new builds that were in um, in Lower Hutt in Wellington. Mm. And um, certainly, I mean, these are not classic Kiwi houses, you know. That's, mm-hmm. uh, they're not quite leaky homes. Um, but, you know, there's a certain investment property style kind of townhouse. And you see a lot of these in Christchurch as well. Mm. And I mean, I guess they're comfy and cozy, but yeah. they're not solid old Kiwi houses like the old days, you know. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. And I think that just shows that this just speaks to what people can afford these days, essentially. So, you know, you, you, you inflate everyone's money away, they, they're going to afford smaller houses or ones that are built on top of each other, you know. Mm. So uh, I, th- that's how I see it, is that the, the market is is providing what people can afford. If people could afford, you know, big houses with big backyards, that's what the market will build. Mm. But um, people can only afford a three-bedroom townhouse um, that's built, you know, next to uh, ten other houses on the same plot of land that had one or two houses on it before. So, yeah, well, it's yeah. It's, it's kind of inflation visualized. I mean, the whole subdivision mm-hmm. thing, and I mean, it's Auckland's is a shocker for this. You know, you got these these old yeah. nice houses, you know, classic Kiwi houses, and then you know, you got five places now on that same same piece. And if it weren't for some of the laws, I'd imagine you'd have even smaller houses. You know, I think some of the uh, councils restrict, you know, sort of tiny home type things. But I think if it was possible, people would be doing them. You know, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Well, um, we're not too far away from container houses. So. Yeah. Oh no, what do we call them? We call them pods. Pods. Yeah, yeah. You'll be happy. Yeah. Um, but I, I guess I wanted to also talk a bit about the nature of the construction industry broadly because I know um, uh, for our New Zealand listeners, um, people be, will be aware of like Fletcher Construction and some of these companies that have had some real major financial issues. And obviously, with inflation, it makes it really hard to plan longer term projects. And so I'm thinking maybe a little bit more broadly in civil. Mm construction um maybe do you have any comments on just how inflation has inf- impacted planning for bigger infrastructure stuff yeah i mean it's 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 quite it's quite clear to see in the industry to be honest because projects that that had started let's say before before the covid era you, you know you had allowed a certain price for for something and all of a sudden material is you know six months delay plus 50 percent additional cost uh, it makes it really hard to plan. You can imagine a five-year project, your prices are suddenly 50% more towards the end of it. How are you supposed to to plan or make money on a project? So you can see that in the industry, there's a lot of buildings and, and other projects that have just taken twice as long as they, as they should have or costed. You know, the, the, the tunnel is a good example. I think they... Was it something like double what they had allowed for, from three billion to six billion? I think it was um, in, the, in Auckland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the that's the tunnel project they're doing through the CBD there. Yeah. Um. And you know, that's just one project. You just you look around, and a, a lot of them are delay. You know, got major delays on them. And yeah, yeah. Well, there's almost this whiplash, right? As the project mm. starts accumulating. You know, I don't work in this yeah. industry, but I imagine you know as you get closer to the finish, it's like that last ten percent ends up stretching, stretching <laughs> yeah. out. You know, yeah, hundred percent, yeah, yeah. Um, and as I said, I mean, there's uh, certainly challenges uh, come. You know, from where I'm living here in Japan, looking back at New Zealand, you've got just a few players when it comes to major infrastructure, major construction projects, with Fletcher mm-hmm. Construction being one of them, and that you know, has its tendrils down into a couple of um, sub companies, including like Higgins and, you know, all of these mm-hmm. you know, infrastructure companies. Yeah. And yet there's there's major labor shortages, major infra- uh, inflation costs as well. Mm-hmm. And basically it's like, how do you even get stuff built? And this is the classic, um, you know, orange cones everywhere on the road, uh, <laughs> lo- you know, blown out budgets, projects taking forever that every Kiwi is aware of. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, was it always like that? I don't, I can't remember, but. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm not sure if we're just, more aware of it now or yeah. it's, it's just getting worse and worse but um yeah it's it, it seems like it doesn't 
I, I read something something somewhere about you know those orange traffic cones. It's um it's like seven dollars a day to lease those out for oh yeah <laughs> for um for construction projects or infrastructure. And um that's like how many millions of dollars have been spent just on mm. cones. It's a bit yeah. of a meme at this point, but um yeah yeah I'm pretty sure traffic management is like is a huge burden on on uh, the cost of eroding. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, but, but that said, I mean there is bigger challenges, right? Labor. Um, and and yeah. then just capital as well, because, you know, like you kind of, how do you invest mm. in these things? Yeah. So a, another thing I wanted to touch on. So when you have a, a, a demand cause, for, you know, a, a demand caused by uh, money printing or inflation in general, um, and, and people try to save themselves by buying houses, you, you, you're basically telling the market that you want more houses. So it takes those people away from doing what, you know, the other job that they could be doing and that could be, you know, working on other infrastructure projects or, or, or one on and, and become builders or, you know, and, and you, the, the, the market is so distorted and, you know, pe- it's almost like people are jumping around from, from one sector to another to where, to where the, the money is being spent at the time. And I just feel like it, it's, it's a bit of, um, you know, the capital is not really allocated properly. That's interesting. It's quite frothy then, in a sense that, I mean, I'm, I, you know, we're talking about civil infrastructure projects just now, but I mean, there's a reason. There's a lot of delays. It's maybe not enough of a workforce, but then you've got the whole residential construction sector, and then everything uh, sort of surrounding that. Mm. Um, and uh, yeah, you're right. I mean, with limited resources, sort of, where do they go? Um, do you, mm-hmm. you know, do you build a house or do you build a road? Do you build a power station? I mean, yeah. sort of the market is allocating towards residential construction potentially. Yeah, I mean, you you can yeah, every you know you you've got so many real estate agents around. You've got so many mortgage brokers, and really, do we do we need that many? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I'd say what is it twenty or thirty percent of our of our. Um, uh, economy is basically built on housing <laughs> us so, buying yeah. and selling houses to each other <laughs> yeah yeah well, and it's not productive i mean, there's, I mean there's, there's no um it's not a capital good you know mm-hmm. a, a factory or a commercial building actually helps build the economy whereas house a house is a house um, yeah i mean obviously people need to live somewhere and, and houses need to be built but you know buying a, a house and you know fix it up a little bit and sell it on yeah. Did you really achieve much? Did, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and the more the more I've gotten into Bitcoin, you know, we I I personally am invested. I have pro- an investment property from a while ago that me and my siblings uh, went in on ten years ago. Or so, and at this time, I'm just like, I can't wait to get rid of that thing. It's just <laughs> a headache. Yeah. It's like yeah, I just feel like a bit of a, a rent seeker to be honest um, as well. So. Yeah, it's, interesting. It's, kind of, it's, it's changed my way of thinking a lot, to be honest. And financially, you'd be much better off not not having it if you did something else with it. And we both know what that thing is. <laughs> yeah, no, um, oh, that's interesting. So, I mean, broadly, then, I mean, what is your outlook? So, it sounds like you guys do a, a, a quite a few different things, but in terms of specifically the residential side, I mean, are you seeing an uptick? I mean, you, you say the company's growing. I mean, are you benefiting maybe from part of that growth of the housing industry you got yourselves? Yeah. Or yeah. It, yeah yeah i mean we do it's you know it comes in cycles and we try to ride the waves um uh and you know at the beginning of a cycle it could be housing to start with but then commercial projects take take longer so that's where our temporary works comes in um uh, and then by the time those kind of slow down again housing comes back so we are you know i'm (laughs) i do sound like i'm complaining but we do benefit from it as a business um and uh we we allocate our resources uh, as necessary, but what we've also done is uh, we've diversified uh, our business. You know, there's some companies that do structural design for residential only, and you know they've been hit quite badly. I'd say in the last year, housing has slowed down. You know, rich people build houses when they want to, so you know those houses, uh, those projects carry on, but. Um, your normal renovation um, job or a single house, single dwelling, those have died down a lot, I'd say. Yeah. Mm. So um, just to give you some numbers, I'd say in 2022, uh, 50% of our work was residential. And uh, now it's probably about 15 to 
I understood. Uh, just to answer your other question, it has come, it feels like it's coming back now. There's a bit of optimism um, in the market. Uh, but, you know, for, for me personally, I think it's going to take maybe six months to nine months to to turn around. Yeah, yeah it's interesting because, I mean, I've got, uh, you know, feet in both camps where on one hand I'm a hardcore back Bitcoiner and, uh, you know, mm. I think, uh, you know, as you could imagine, I think a certain way about things, but then, you know, you still interface with the normal world and, I mean, you talk to friends and family about housing and, and the state of the economy and I don't know, that's sort of, uh, the key word that comes out is it's a lot of performance, I think, you know, there's a lot of masquerading out of numbers around inflation and interest mm. rates and all of these things yeah. and I, I, when you come back to the first principles about the engineering, I think, well, yeah. it's what's well, different? What, what is different about it this time, you you know, it just feels like we're going for another ride. Another ride, um, yeah. and, and and it's it's crazy to be honest. I've got some mates that are sorry to to interrupt no. you. Um, I've got a friend, you know, who's a mortgage broker, and he goes to auctions often. And you know, interest rates dropped fifty percent, um, fifty basis points. Um, and you know, the week after the auction room was buzzing. Yeah. So you know, people are falling for the same thing again, and they'll do the same thing and. Buy a house, you know, buy investment properties because rates are coming down, and it just, yeah, it feels like a, you know, we're going through a loop. <laughs> well, you, you know, it's interesting, Anes. Uh, looking at the history of property bubbles, this isn't a new thing, and there was a major one that I've read about in terms of the Asian financial crisis, which was pretty much driven by property. And you had a you had countries like Thailand, which uh, you know, it's a middle a middle country incredibly hocked up with investment properties and like imp- apartment buildings and you know tower mansions mm-hmm. and uh, I think this was like 1997 kind of thing oh yeah and um, basically that all fell over because you you plow money into these investment properties which are not capital goods they don't make mm-hmm. value they uh, mm-hmm. they, they sink, you know it's their, their value sink and you that's at the expense of actually building a productive economy and this mm-hmm. has been this goes all the way back I mean it's happened in many places around the world and it's this kind of frothy, speculative, consumer-driven uh, investment into property, which is mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, the speculation happens in Bitcoin as well. To be honest, you know, <laughs> it's not immune from that. But you know, I, I do you do see it in the property um, market all the time. Uh, I think New Zealand is in a bit of a, a different place from Thailand. I'd say you know, families and people actually want to come and live here for the long term, and you know, pro- property you know, dare I say it, seems to be a safe bet. Mm. I actually had a look at the numbers not long ago and it, house prices on average grow 6 to 7% a year. And guess what the monetary inflation rate is? <laughs> Well, just on that note, I mean, I mean, but the coming back to the point around Bitcoin as speculation, though, I think there is a, a market difference, though, because you can always build more houses. And, you know, I've mm-hmm. personally seen, you know, these you know, Southeast Asia with the Asian financial crisis, you know, there's these tower mansions which are uninhabited and there's a couple in Bangkok that are like unfinished from 97. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah, like there's quite a famous one that's yeah. um, got finished. Uh, I don't know if that was um, directly at, uh, on the financial crisis. It might, might have been a bit later, but it's like a half finished building. Mm-hmm. And you can always build new ones. Whereas Bitcoin, I think as money, it's it's more the way I think of it is this you know, capital savings. It's It's... Uh, putting money away that can then be deployed, and it's, and it's very liquid because you know the housing mm-hmm. market is the it's the most illiquid thing you could imagine. You can't sell a fraction of a house, yeah. And so <laughs> you've got this very different mechanism, which I think is less speculative than housing. Which in many cases, people buying off the plans, they they've got paper houses, man. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. No, I I I, I do get what you're saying. Yeah. Um, I do think there's. You know, at times is you know that I would say the mean of the Bitcoin price is probably um, not speculative, but you know th- th- there is bubbles in it um, as we see every four four years or so. Um, yeah. But I, I I do agree that we do need something we can just store our money for when we need it, rather than speculate on houses or stocks or or whatever. And that that's just how I've uh, changed my mind, the way I think now, and I just save my money rather than buy unnecessary stuff that I don't need. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's sort of, I mean, my, my journey for the last few weeks has been um, understanding capitalism a bit better and I've mm-hmm. been reading a lot about it because it's quite, a, I mean, that's a bit of a rabbit hole to go down. But the idea of being able to put your money away 
and use mm. it and deploy it for something in the future is quite incredible. And I mean, it sounds kind of silly, but there, there isn't really a mechanism to do that because if you put your money in the bank today, you know, it's going to lose value. And if you put it into the share market, you're basically, uh, you know, riding the wave of monetary inflation in these index funds, which are kind of propped up by this current status quo. But yeah. there's this new place you can park your value. And it just seems like coming back to that enables people to build uh, value and actually create businesses and, and deploy capital yeah. in a way that we're maybe it's almost like we've forgotten how to do that you know yeah i agree i agree with that 100 percent. yeah so i mean it's it's certainly interesting as it relates to infrastructure as well as we were mm. talking about like what what would it take to build a power station or a uh, you know transmission lines or roads or any of these things that actually you know, factories the things that help create value which new zealand's a little bit slow with i mean we we, mm. we do do we get stuff done and people are trying their best um yeah but that's like the nature of the capital kind of changes where the money gets allocated um, yeah and i think new zealand as well it's you know when you travel you see let's say in in um in the uae or in the, in, the, in the Middle East and in the, in the better countries there, Singapore, uh, Hong Kong or whatever, you see their projects take, you know, they're super quick. Um, you know, a, a bridge gets built in a week or, you know, <laughs> six months. In New Zealand, you know, it take us probably four years to plan the thing. Yeah. Uh, and it, I think that's more to do with uh, the amount of capital we actually have in New Zealand. Um, well, there's—I yeah. mean, there's only so many cranes, man, and ex- <laughs> excavators. Like, honestly, people—I yeah. mean, people laugh, but I mean, we're we're sharing basically <laughs> all of the cranes in Wellington and Auckland. Like, um, yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure we had to get that tunneling machine over from what the, was it, either Netherlands or France. <laughs> the one machine, yeah, well, and it's got to go back as soon as the project is done. <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, I mean, that, that's that's a topic for another day, just sort of New Zealand yeah. scale. But I mean, it is interesting. Um, but overall, though, your what? Is, I mean, what is your outlook? I mean, we're coming to the end of 2024. Yeah. I mean, what what is your outlook for say the next 12 months generally? For the economy in general, or oh, I mean, let's let's say let's call it Bitcoin plus your your sector in terms of construction mm. engineering. Uh, so Bitcoin, I'm very bullish on <laughs> right now. <laughs> of uh, course, yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I, I try try not to get a, uh, too ahead of myself. Um, yeah. yeah, you know, stay uh, humble, stay safe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, this is my second bull market now, and uh, I honestly like the bear market better. It's just oh, so noisy right now. Yeah. Um, yeah, everyone's got a price prediction. Um, I am bullish on Bitcoin. I think uh, countries are figuring it out. Um, big, big companies, big institutions are, are figuring it out. It will take time for them to come, you know, come around. Uh, I think it's, it's, it might be a little bit too small in size. They might, you know, dip their toes a little bit, but maybe not in size at the moment. Uh, so, you know, there will be a few big players that come in this this cycle i think mm. maybe a couple of nations that might um you know sovereign wealth funds or whatever yeah uh, i think that that's very likely mm. um in regards to the uh strategic bitcoin reserve i don't really have comments about that yeah 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 <laughs> um yeah well it's early days we'll see what happens but i mean this game yeah. theory is playing out right it's yeah playing. i think i think it was always going to happen you know someone had to make the move eventually and uh, I, th- I think you're seeing it happen in, in real time which is yeah. it's quite crazy actually mm-hmm. um if you if you told me three years ago you know when i was first three four years ago when i was first orange build that this would happen this quickly i'd, I'd be like no way <laughs> yeah 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 um in terms of the business i'm i'm quite i'm quite positive actually we've you know a lot of companies were laying off staff uh, over the last year we've you know we've been busy throughout the year had a few uh slow periods but you know nothing major we are actually looking to hire at the moment so um hopefully we'll have a new uh, draftsman soon and maybe some uh, a new engineer in the new year so in terms of the economy in, in, in new zealand i do see it coming back a little bit yeah um, yeah. yeah, a little bit of optimism. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, yeah, at the rate of devaluation, basically. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> a bit of a caveat there. Oh, that, yeah, that, that's awesome, man. Well, I just yeah, I, I think what you got, what you guys are doing, uh, your team and your your brothers there, what you guys are doing is is awesome, and uh, it's cool to see a New Zealand business come out and talk <laughs> about having a Bitcoin treasury because I don't know if there's many others out there, man. Well, maybe they are, but they're just keeping it. Uh, yeah, keeping it I, the I, I'd imagine there'd be a few. Yeah, 
I think there'll be a few. Um, yeah. So, um, you know, we haven't really advertised that much. There was one person that almost made a Bitcoin, but decided not to. Yeah. Uh, good on him. He's, he's done well with it. Um, yeah. uh, but, you know, we'll continue to, to accept Bitcoin because, you know, it saves us from buying it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, if, if anyone's interested in, you know, structural engineering and wants to pay in Bitcoin, welcome you with open arms. So, yeah. you know, yeah. reach out. Yeah, yeah, awesome. So, and if people want to find you guys, um, I guess, yeah, where, where do you want to send them? Yeah, uh, our website is uh, structural-engs.co.nz. And you can find our details there. You can email us or get in touch. Yeah, um, yeah so, um, I mean, hopefully in the future, there will be some big Bitcoin mines built uh, in New Zealand somewhere and we can be involved in, in uh, designing the, the warehouses. So. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, it would be perfect uh, to have you guys come in and build some structurally sound uh, Bitcoin mining facilities. Uh, yeah. We're certainly going to need some more of those um, in the mm. near future. Yeah, I think it's exciting, man. Um, the Bitcoin economy in New Zealand starting to emerge. Yeah, I, I mean, I can see it with the guys at Lightning Pay. You know, they're moving. You know, they're doing bits, and there's a, there's a few things happening. I. I I'm yet to go to a meetup, to be honest. Just been so busy with the new baby and um, and the business as well. Um, but I, I would love to go to um, a meetup in Auckland and you know meet, meet some of the Bitcoiners here. Yeah, yeah. No, that sounds awesome, man. Well, hey, Anessa, I appreciate your time and joining me today and sharing what you guys are working on. I think it's 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 brilliant. And yeah, hope hope we can keep in touch. Thanks, Cody. Appreciate it. Thank you for listening. I am Cody Allingham and that was the transformation of value. If you would like to support this show, please consider making a donation either through my website or by directly tipping to the show's Bitcoin wallet or just pass this episode on to a friend who you think may enjoy it. And you can always email me at hello at the transformation of value.com.